Right, so just to summarize, uh, what we did before was the correct title, as I said at the end, would have been algorithmic information theory. Rather than information theory based on probability and entropy, as in Shannon's information theory, it's information theory based on how much information is required to describe, as in specifying an algorithm um, to determine some computable entity, such as a word. And the second topic I want to talk about now um, is uh, algorithmic randomness. People sometimes call it computable randomness. And this is using computability theory to make sense of the notion of randomness. And um, the idea of this goes back to Alonzo Church, I think from um, the 1940s, who tried to make sense of ideas about randomness due to von Mises, who was somebody that pioneered an early version of probability theory before the current version involving measure theory took off due to Kolmogorov, who got the measure theoretic probability theory um, properly going. Anyway, von Mises describes a notion, tried to base probability theory on the notion of randomness. Church realized that computability theory could help, but the definitions he made weren't very, wasn't very successful. Um, and then in the 1960s, Kolmogorov tried to tried to improve them, and then it reached the subject reached uh, a really good state with contributions by Martin Luff, again, who I mentioned in the first half. They came up with a very good notion of randomness based on um, computability theory. And the purpose of this last part of the this very last part of the, the course is just to introduce you basically to the definition how how computability theory is used to characterize the notion of randomness and as an entry into it i want to consider the question we're given a sequence so for an infinite stream of values that we're somebody is generating for us giving them to us how can we determine if that sequence is random by random, I mean if that sequence is being produced by some bona fide random process that is essentially tantamount to tossing a fair coin or doing some better physical equivalent of that, like doing some quantum mechanical experiment based on spin or something like that, that has perhaps a truly random outcome. How can we, how can we say that, you know, how can we judge the quality of the randomness we get. So somebody tells us that they're giving us a random sequence and that you, you ask for the bits of the sequence and you keep on seeing zero, 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 zero. However many bits you ask for, you're going to get at some point a bit suspicious. But you know, there's a chance that doing, they're running a genuinely random process again, but you know, as you go along, the chance that they really are gets smaller and smaller, and in the end it gets ridiculously small. But if, well, I'm not going to write it out again, but remember the sequence that I was writing on the previous board, you know, something like that, you would be less suspicious. It sort of looks more like a random sequence. Is there a way we can kind of detect, yes, the sequence is random, or, or detect that, no, it's not random, and um, Martin Love basically developed the idea that probably had some precursors, I don't know, but he developed a successful definition. But as actually using computability theory, one could get a very sensible notion of a test that one can apply or a family of tests that you can apply to detect non-randomness. So the idea of 
the given a sequence and you get suspicious about the randomness, you're essentially going to be looking for patterns in the sequence. In this case, there's a very clear pattern. Um, and then you might start testing to see if your hypothesis of this pattern is, is really true. And you want the pattern to be such that for longer and longer occurrences of the pattern, there's a smaller and smaller probability that a natural random process would get that, would, would give you that pattern. So I'm going to show you the kind of test that, that, that I'm talking about with two examples of such a test. First, the, 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 the test that's going to pick up the non the, the very obvious non-randomness of this sequence. So, um, so a test, a test that detects that zero to the omega, the infinite sequence of zeros is non-random. So the idea of these tests is, is all the same. The test will be such that you say, well, I'm allowed, I'll allow myself some small probability epsilon of making an error. But I want to apply a test which will only be fooled with probability less than epsilon. So I'll say that I've detected non-randomness, but there's a problem but with probability less than epsilon, perhaps actually what I saw was generated by a truly random phenomenon. So, so the test that we have here is given my threshold epsilon within, within which I'm prepared to make a mistake, so that's some small epsilon greater than zero, find an n such that q to the minus n is less than epsilon. Then check my sequence to see if the first n bits are all zeros. So check my sequence P for so ID. You ask the question, does P restricted to N, we look at the first, sorry, the capital N equals zero to the N. Um, if the answer is yes, we have detected all randomness. And we can then say the sequence zero to the omega to zeros is not is a non-random sequence because for any epsilon greater than zero, it will satisfy the test. So however small we make the threshold, whatever, however low the probability of error, it will satisfy the, the threshold. Um, zero to the omega is genuinely non-random. Any epsilon goes to zero, the test is satisfied. However small we make it. Yeah. So I I say, well, I'm very, very, very suspicious. Um, but I want to be very convinced. So I'm going to make my probability of error one over two to the one thousand, which is such a small probability, you know, that it's a I'm probably more, you know, the, the universe, is, well, you know, some interstellar activity is likely to zap me with radiation. That's, that's, that's probably more likely than that test failing. Anyway, let's not get into the physics of that um, or the cosmology of it or whatever. Um, anyway, that's a very, very simple test for non randomness. 
Let's have a look at a, a, a more subtle test. Um, so those of you who've done some probability theory will know the law of large numbers. Um, the weak version of the law of large numbers is the following. Um, Probability one. Randomly generated sequence generated by a fair a se an infinite sequence of independent fair coin tosses. Uh, I'll just put fair to say that fair sequence A. Satisfies that on average, the relative frequencies of heads versus tails converges to a half, a half. So you can write that as the, um, but the sequence um, sequence one over n. So we could we consider the sum from i is zero to n minus one of the first so the sum of the first n values of pi divide that by n to get the average value of p and i that that sequence in n converges it's a convergent sequence and its limit Is one half. So any random sequence is going to be you know, the, the average number of heads versus tails on the prefixes will tend to to a half to be balanced in that way. But we can turn this into a testable property for non-randomness because a non-random sequence, if this is property satisfied by a random sequence, a non-random sequence will satisfy that this sequence doesn't converge to one half. And what does that mean? Well, so, so if P is non-random, then for any delta greater than zero, which is a distance from a half, no, not for any delta, there, there must exist some delta greater than zero, such that the such that the averages differ from a half by at least delta infinitely often. That's the contrapositive, that would be not the contrapositive, that's the um, negation of the sequence converging. So if it is non-random, then there exists a delta greater than zero such that such that for infinitely of infinitely many n the average so for infinitely many lengths of prefixes the average outcome over that prefix differs from a half by at least delta. So the sum of the first of the first n values, the average of that differs from a half by oops, at least not the most delta by at least delta. But in the sequence consists of zero and one at uh, at the zero and zero and zero and um well so this is a test for non-randomness so if we have um 
Oh, sorry, yeah, I've done so the word contrapositive should have been used because I turned it from the incorrect from the positive. Yeah? So if there is this, this property, then the sequence is non-random. Not every yeah, no, thank you very much. So not every non-random sequence enjoys this property. Um the point is any random sequence or any random se random sequences with probability you want. It converges. So if if the limit, if the sequence of averages doesn't converge, then that's a way of detecting non-randomness. It won't succeed in detecting non-randomness for the alternating sequence 0, 1, 0, 1, but other tests will be able to detect the non-randomness of that. Just looking for some different tests. So this was a test that just worked for the sequence zero. Of zeros, this is a test that works for many sequences for those sequences where you notice if you were plotting, you know, if you were plotting a bias coin, you would begin to notice that this non-randomness factors that is bias. So, so if you get old, then P is non-random. So here, this is the test involving a delta and infinitely often. So we can't test if something holds infinitely often. So how do we turn this into a test of the form the similar of a similar form to the previous test that um, that we had? Um, so given an infinite sequence, what we could do. Um, so is given a delta, and I just want to see whether I use it. Or n in my notes, so what I use. Um, just to make it consistent. Give delta and an n, consider T sub n, which is going to be all those sequences with infinite, infinite sequences of zero over the ones, such that for at least n different values. Values of I, the, the mean for the first I values, so some full oh, let's say M, you can get such different my notes. I'm going to make this a strict inequality just to be consistent with my notes, but any, anyway, it's easily work with either. So here we're looking at those sequences such that there are n different, there are n different places in the sequence that the average up to up to position up to the current position of it up to the place. Um, differs from a half by raised by by more than delta. Okay, so this is the property we can test because we keep on testing and checking if we if our running average has differed by at least delta by by more than delta at least n times so far. And if it hasn't been, we talked again, and we, well, we get another value that we expect. And eventually, you know, we might carry on forever, but we may get, if, if, it, if this property holds, we will eventually detect it. In the open, in the topology, in the sequences. So we can verify this in finite time if it holds. I 
Hold the trigger. And again, it holds holds that to take the, the limit as n tends to infinity of what I mean by land root Tn is the probability that a random sequence lands in the set Tn. Okay, so lambda is going to be probability assigned to subsets, probability measure assigned to subsets. For those of you who've done probability theory, it's, de it's defined on the, it can be defined on the Borel measures of, the, oh, sorry, on the Borel subsets of our space of infinite sequences. For those of you who've not done that level of probability theory, it doesn't matter, it's going to be a well-defined probability function on the open subsets. For this lecture, that every open set has a probability that a random sequence will land in it. And in this case, the probability is n tends to infinity as we check the number of times. So n is the number of times we've got a prefix that can be average different from a half by more than delta. Um, so we've got a fixed delta here with varying n. And the limit as n tends to infinity by probability theory equals. Defined in equals zero, this is this follows from the this is by probability theory law of large numbers. Holds that. And so once again, given an epsilon, we have the same kind of test as before. Given an epsilon, that's a kind of Tolerance for error, for, for error, given epsilon, we find n such that lambda t sub n is less than epsilon, which we can do because the, effect, the probability of the effect turns to, turn to zero, and then apply that, apply the test. Tn to any sequence to 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 any to the sequence. And if our sequence infinite sequence satisfies this property, but for infinitely many prefixes of it. We differ from the average by at least delta, then it will satisfy all these tests. Okay, so so that's cool. Such a let's say such a sequence has delta bias. So, so here we say p and delta bias, and so the point is if p has delta bias. Any sequence that differs by the average difference by at least delta is really often as delta by and from delta and the relevant effect for the delta will indeed, you know, for any epsilon we can detect the non-randomness of this of the sequence by showing that for some preposterously large number of times, depending on the epsilon, um the Averages of the prefixes differ from a half by a least delta. So if P has delta bias, it satisfies the test. So any such P we're detecting, so we detect the non randomness of any such P. Non randomness. Any such okay. So what Martin Love did was he took examples like this and he realized there's a general pattern to these tests, which is a general pattern we can apply as a way of detecting non-randomness. A general, a general approach to defining such tests of non-randomness. 
Notice that there hasn't been any computability theory so far, but there will be. The computability theory will come up with it. So solve a problem. So, a naive, you know, being naive as being a bit innocent about things, so doing something in a way that's um, not taking into account the full realities of the situation. So a naive notion of non-randomness test. So a test for non-randomness. Okay. A test is a sequence T sub n of open subsets of sets of particular sequences. The reason we use open subsets is so an open subset is one, as you will recall, that any infinite um, any infinite sequence that belongs, if an infinite sequence belongs to the set, then some finite prefix of it belongs to the set. And the point of an open subset is, in some sense, we can detect if an infinite sequence belongs to it because we only need to do test finitely many things. So if we, we get if an infinite sequence belongs to the the, the, the set we can detect that using only by looking at only a finite portion of the infinite sequence. So that's why we look at open subsets so we can actually find a perform the test, as it were. There's a little caveat there, but the caveat will be addressed later on. Um, the test is going to be a sequence of open subsets of the, the set of infinite sequences such that. If you consider the sequence of probabilities of the sets, I haven't defined what the probability of an open set is, but um, let's take that as, as given for the moment. That converges and equals zero. So, so eventually, you know, but well, for any epsilon, we can find the test whose probability is smaller than epsilon. And this is just it for the naive definition of, of that. And we say that that P satisfies the test of P test. Tn if p belongs to every set t sub n. So if p is contained in the intersection of all the tns. The point is such a p for any epsilon threshold of error, error tolerance that we have for any epsilon. We'll apply the appropriate T sub n for some sufficiently large n, and we will see that P belongs to that test. It's, it's an open, so we it's an open set, so we can by doing looking at finitely many bits of P, we can see that it satisfies the, the test. But if it were randomly generated, that would only happen with probability less than epsilon. So therefore, we're you know we're happy that much of a very small chance of error, we've detected non-randomness. And if that holds for all n, well, that means, you know, however small we make the threshold, we still detect it. We do, we, we might then say that we've detected the non-random, we've really detected the true non-randomness of P. So, 
So that the left element. P is non-random if there exists a test T and that satisfies. You know, so for a non-random P, we need to spot the pattern and define the appropriate test, and then for for you know. Whatever epsilon will be able to verify that P, P is non random. So for 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, as, the, as you raised, um, you will need to find an appropriate test, which is not hard to do. Um, and P is random if it satisfies every test. Okay, so I said this is naive. Sorry, so P is random if it is not non random. Yeah, very sorry. There's people who like funny logic, so it's a very Classical definition of randomness. If you're not not random, then you're random. Um, okay. Does anyone have an inkling of why I use this word naive here? What's the problem with this definition? Any idea? <laughs> But there certainly exists tests. I mean, there are lots of tests one can have, but. Sorry? Right, nothing is random. Yeah. So this is too naive. Let's go. So, so what's the reason? Right. Well, the prefix of P and size N the, the cylinder, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with the naive definition, With the naive definition, definition of test, no P is random. So given P, consider test P sub M is exactly as you said, it's the cylinder. Determined by the prefix of P, like N. It's just the same as with the infinite sequence of zeros. You know, so the, the cylinder of the empty sequence is the whole set. The cylinder of the of uh, like the three, the, the three bit prefix um, has well, it's got the first three digits of. In all sequences that begin with the same first three digits as P, so that had probability one eighth. It's probability one eighth that a random sequence will have the same three digits of P. For any the first K digits of P, the probability is going to be one over two to the K, so it certainly converges to zero. The probability is converges to zero, and the word P is in the test. So there's obviously something wrong here because I mean, if you're not randomly generating a as a sequence, you shouldn't test, you shouldn't be allowed to test the sequence using a random test that is based on the sequence itself. Now, if you want to test the randomness of something, you want some test that's given independently of the, of the sequence. So can anyone guess how we're going to solve the problem? In some rough, not, not precisely, but in a a rough way. 
So what haven't we used so far? Computability theory. So we're going to use computability theory to solve the problem. But it's a natural thing to do so, because we want our, you know, we want our test to be given somehow a priori independently of the sequence that we're testing. So you know, one way a test can be given is algorithmically. If a test is given algorithmically, then you know that's some sort of a priori way of giving the test without reference to the thing to the to the sequence that we're testing. Um, so a Martin law. So, so let me catch what's on the board using let's maybe use blue for the new buttons. So a Martin Lot non random this test. So this was Martin. Yeah, Martin Love wasn't the first person to try to use computability theory here. Alonzo Kirk tried something, but not using this notion of test. Um, Tom Gorov was doing related things. But anyway, Martin Love came in with uh, a Martin Love test. Is a so we want our sequence of open subsets to be given computably. So we're going to require it to be a computable sequence of computable open subsets such that this limit holds with a computable rate of convergence. Where we need to know what a computable sequence of computable open subsets is, and we need to know what a computable rate of convergence is. And then we have the definition, then we understand the definition of a Martin Lump third. And basically, it means to it means all the information is given algorithmically. Which is good because you then have a finite description that's providing all the information, namely the algorithm that gives it. So it's actually, let's start with the computable rate of convergence because that's really easy. There's actually a general notion of computable rate of convergence for a Cauchy sequence, which we could go through, but here we're in a special case that we want a computable rate of convergence to the limit zero, and that's a simpler situation. So I'm just going to give an equivalent definition that works in this case. So So lim xn tends to zero with a computable rate of convergence. Sorry, you know, then xn equals zero. You either write xn as a sequence tends to zero or the limit equals zero, but mixing notation here. So this happens with a computable rate of convergence. So one can give many equivalent formulations of this, but the one I like is if or if there exists, exists a computable total increasing function on the numbers such that for any n greater than equal to zero, um, Absolute value of, of xm is less than two to the minus f of n
productivity. Newton minus n are all n greater than equal to n. So what they say, so this is like giving our epsilon. We're giving them, and then we want to say, we want to be within two to the minus n of zero. And F tells us how far we need to look along the sequence to, to get that. Okay, so that's easy. Um, So computable open set, well actually a computable open set is just going to be a semi-dividable set in the sense of two lectures ago. So whichever lecture it was where we did the topology of where we did topological properties of the of um the space of internet sequences. So a computable open set. Is just a semi dividable set. So remember, we saw that every semi dividable set was open. And then we also looked at the cloven sets, the sets that were closed and open, so that those coincided with the decidable subsets. But the semi dividable subsets, not every open set was a semi decidable subset. So we just call the ones that are the, the, those open sets that are semi decidable, we'll call them the computable open sets. So it's a funny terminology. And actually, this definition is not going to help us say what the computable sequence of computable open sets is. So let me give an equivalent definition of computable open set, which will allow us to say what a, an infinite sequence, a computable sequence of computable open sets is. So alternatively and equivalently, let's consider a representing alphabet, and I'm going to define a representation of open sets, and a computable one will be a computable element in the representation. So consider the alphabet Sigma, can I give it an actual name? Um, sigma O for the alpha that represents the given sets is going to be, we're going to have zero, one, semicolon, and empty set. And we're going to define a representation in the sense of type two representation. So representation by infinite sequences, we define a type two representation gamma, like we call representations of open stats, which goes from the open. Well, this goes from infinite words over the alphabet, the partial surjective function onto the open sets of the set of infinite sequences. And it's the main. So the domain of this representation, gamma of the curve O, is consists of sequences. W0 semicolon W1 semicolon W2 semicolon W3 semicolon W4 semicolon where every WI is either a binary word 
over so a finite word over zero one, or it's the empty set symbol. And such a P, let's call this P. So such a P represents the open set. The open set, which is the union over all the, over all the, I, the infinitely many I's of N's and the infinitely many numbers of all numbers of the cylinder set determined by W I, where, well, what? So that makes sense. So it's the set of all words beginning with the prefix W I in the case that W I belongs to is actually a binary word, but W I might also be an empty set symbol where, so in that case, by the cylinder set, it just be the empty set. Where the cylinder, the new notation, the cylinder set of, so to speak, it's not really a cylinder set, but the notation of the empty set symbol is just defined to be the empty set. The point is, every open set is a countable union of cylinder sets. So we can represent such a countable union by just considering the countable sequence of the words defining the cylinders. But if we didn't put in a symbol for the empty set, we wouldn't be able to represent the empty set that way at all. To represent the empty set, we need to give empty set, semicolon, empty set, semicolon, empty set, semicolon, empty set. That's, the, that's going to be the name for the empty set. Um, so that's the reason for putting the empty set symbol in, just so we get the empty set in our representation. There are other ways of doing it, but this represents this open set. And a computable open set is simply a computable open set is, is just a computable element. For the representation of open sets. So, in other words, it's an open set that has a computable name. But these sets are exactly the semi decidable sets. So, when you have a computable name, that means you've got a computable way of getting a sequence of um, prefixes for the cylinder. You can test an infinite word for that by you going through the sequences until you find one that gives the, uh, until you find. A prefix in the sequence that matches the prefix of your infinite word. And that gives you a way of testing whether an infinite sequence is in the test. The other direction, if you have a semi decidable property, it's a bit more complicated, but I'll leave that as an exercise for you. I don't want to go into it, but it matches the same thing as a semi decidable set. Um, so, just to say that the fact that we're using semi decidable sets here. Is nice because that's saying that's also giving us a, a strong correspondence between our idea that we want to test whether an infinite sequence belongs to a test. It belongs to a test set. We want to actually be able to verify that an infinite sequence belongs to a test set. We can do that using the um, you know, using the semi decidability. Okay, so now a computable sequence of open computable open sets. So lastly, given a type three representation any type two representation of the set X, the partial subjective function from infinite sequences over an alphabet signal to X. We define a type two type two type two representation, which I've called gamma to the omega, which is again a representation 
now of the steps of infinite sequences of components of the steps. Individual sequences of X. From X. This is easy. We want to we want to view. And so once we've got infinite word names encoding elements of the set X. We want to combine a sequence, an infinite sequence of infinite word names into a single infinite word name. We can do that using the pairing function from pairs of natural numbers to natural numbers, which is the bijection. This pairing function we we have in the first part of the course, which is very useful. So we simply define gamma to the omega of a number of um, of a word. E. We view this as so this is a word, an infinite word, which is a name over the alphabet um, so sigma, an infinite word name over the, over the alphabet sigma, so an infinite sequence of sigmas. We want to essentially <coughs> divide this infinite sequence up as a countable sequence of infinite sequences using the pairing function to engineer that. Um, so this is the, the sequence. This gives us the sequence this is going to be going to give us an element of an infinite sequence. So it's it's n maps to what the nth element of the sequence, and we simply apply gamma to So you want yeah an infinite sequence so, it's, so this is right so gamma applies to infinite sequences over the alphabet we apply it to the, the sequence of um p so this is p the sequence here indexed by p m n uh, this is the pairing function. So it's that sequence indexed by n. So we're using the so pairing function. Remember, this p pairing function. So this is so this is p the, the infinite sequence, and this p is the pairing function, which pairs natural numbers as a single natural number bijectively from lecture, whatever it was, I don't know, um, three or something, three or four, a long time ago. Okay, so it's easy to encode infinite sequences in type, using type two representations, and a computable sequence of computable open sets, so A on Computable sequence of computable open sets is a computable element of representation. Representation of the opens to the omega, so which is a representation from sigma of the opens for the infinite word of those that of the set of open sets of of infinite words, the infinite sequence of the open sets of infinite words. We're trying to get a computable sequence of computable open sets. And we've now 
said that we've now defined all the concepts used in the definition of Martin Love Brandon of Martin Love test. Okay, so so just to say once again, it's basically you can go to a large extent with the naive version of the test, understand that, but all we're requiring is this rate of convergence is given computably, and in addition to that, the description of the open sets, the sequence of open sets is given algorithmically, which actually allows us to access, given so given our epsilon, we, you know, we, 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 well, we start with an n expressing the two to the minus n of the threshold, we apply our computable rate of convergence to see how far along the sequence of tests we need to use it. We use the fact that it's computable to get effectively a name from it. And that actually gives us a semi-decision procedure for the test that we can apply to the sequence we want to test for non-randomness and apply it and see either, you know, it's a semi-decision procedure, but if it terminates in finite time, we say, hey, hey yes, we've detected the non-randomness of our sequence within our specified error threshold. So, so it's the same definitions as before now, basically. A sequence is non-random, is not, is not ML random, but ML means Martin Lock, if, uh, if it satisfies some, some Martin Lock test, And the sequence is, I don't know why I call it with the first one, but the sequence is Martin Lock random. That's what it's called, Martin Lock random. If it satisfies no Martin Lock class. From empty set of the set of Martin Lock random sequences, Martin Lock. And in sequences is a non empty F sigma set. F sigma set, we did G delta sets before, G delta sets were countable intersections of open sets, and F sigma set is the complement of those, that's countable unions of closed sets. Which has probability one. Oh, I realized that the other thing I didn't define was what the probability of an open set is, but that's not difficult to define. You any open set can be expressed as a disjoint union of cylinder sets, and then it's just the sum of the probability of those disjoint cylinder sets. I'll include that in the notes. I mean, it's basic probability theory, but the probability associated with um, Borel sets, which include open sets and F sigma sets. But the point is, we have many, many ML random sequences, particularly it has probability one. 
So if you generate a sequence by random, it is likely to satisfy, I mean, you know, with probability one, that infinite sequence will enjoy the property of being Martin not random. That is, it will not satisfy any test for non-randomness according to this definition. So one of the ways to prove this is very nice. We don't have time for it, but it's very nice. It's to prove that there exists what's called a universal Martin Love test. So there is a single Martin Love test that says a single computable sequence of computable open subsets satisfying this computable rate of convergence property. But just this one sequence of tests will detect any non random sequence. So it's a universal test for non randomness. That's an amazing property. The proof is not very difficult, but it would require another week of lectures to go into that. I don't want to go on much longer. I just want to end with one further result, which I'm also not going to prove because it's a very deep result. It's a beautiful and surprising result. So, Final theorem of the course. Just to be stated but not proved. This is due to the Schnorr. I think his name is spelled like that, which is the following are equivalent. Okay. An infinite sequence. Infinite sequence of binary limits. So firstly, B is Martin not random. Secondly, does anyone have an idea what the equivalence? <clears throat> Sorry? The thing that we did in the first part, yes. So P is prefix incompressible. This is really quite a deep result. So we're taking well, certainly a whole lecture by itself to develop develop this. Um, so this is really nice. We've got two. Contrasting and complementary views of randomness in a sense. The one is randomness means we can't detect any non randomness properties of the sequence. And another is that if the sequence is randomly generated, then you know, random generation is indeed a way of giving ourselves prefixes of high algorithmic information or high algorithmic complexity where one needs this prefix incompressibility this prefix this prefix complexity to get it to work so it's high complexity in the sense if you cannot compress such a sequence the prefixes of such a random sequence more than an additive value below the length of the length of the prefix so i think that's a really beautiful correspondence here and the third equivalent that people use, which is to do with unpredictability using a notion of martingale that's similar to the probability theoretic notion of martingale, but that's getting much more, more, much more technical. But this, this equivalence is sort of combining these two projects, algorithmic randomness and algorithmic information theory. And um, yeah, well, so we'll end with that. Um, so the, as I told you, some of today's material, well, today's material is essentially going to be examinable in the oral exam by electing to go for difficult topics. I shall just in general for the oral exam, I'm going to send out more information about that very soon. I'm going to put a, 
a list of topics, I can tell you a bit more precisely the kind of questions that I'm going to ask on that. So having done that, let me turn the recording